Silvopasture is one form of what we call agroforestry. It's where we combine the traditional activities of an agricultural act, uh, practice, like it could be agriculture or livestock, and blend it in with uh, forestry practices, in this case, timber production. Uh, a lot of uh, countries around the world use this and have used it historically for uh, thousands of years. We in the United States are adopting it a little bit later than a lot of countries because we're land rich. We, we can separate out pasture land from timber land and, and are able to do this, but more developing countries that don't have that luxury, so they're liable to combine uh, those activities. There are a couple major ways you can approach setting these things, uh, this kind of system up, where you can blending them together. Uh, part of it is you could start with an open pasture and then treat and then plant rows of trees, which is what we did here. Or you could start with a forest situation and thin it down and then plant, establish the forage crop underneath, which is what we're planning to do out at the ag farm uh, outside of Nacogdoches. The stand we're standing in right now is 18 years old. It was established as a civil pasture demonstration area where we wanted to show the differences in a traditional spacing of, of planting trees versus a civil pasture spacing and compare also two uh, uh, tree crops, uh, loblolly pine and longleaf pine. We are standing in uh, one, uh, one of the stands for loblolly pine uh, right now. So 18 years later, we're still seeing uh, grass uh, production, although not much, in, in this, this area. It requires a lot of activities to do this. this. This is not just plant some trees and walk away, which is kind of like what we did, which is one reason it's not working very well. Um, but it was, the idea is that you're going to have to probably rip the soil because it was compacted with livestock. Uh, you fertilize it. You have to provide livestock uh, access to water. Fencing it becomes a, a more expensive value as well. So you've got a lot of these inputs in there, but you get two things coming off of this, or possibly three. You get the forage production, and that could be in the form of hay, which is what we originally had them harvest here before the, the trees got tall enough. We didn't want the cows in here. Or it becomes uh, transferred over into the livestock production. It could be cattle. It could be sheep. It could be goats. You know, a lot of variations on that. The spacing between uh, rows of trees is not set in stone. There is no standard that you could have there. What you see here behind me is a single row spacing of 32 feet between rows silvopasture. Now you can expand that to 42 feet and have a double row of trees. In some cases I've seen triple rows of trees with even wider spacing. It's the idea of how whatever is appropriate to blend in the combination of tree production and forage production. In this case, we kept the cows off the property for three years after establishment to avoid any impacts on the seedlings uh, from trampling. Not that they're going to eat the seedling, uh, although there might be a little exploration. What does that taste like? It's green. But what we're looking for is to let the trees grow up enough so that they're not going to be trampled uh, by the livestock. And so they were able to harvest uh, forage off of this in the form of hay. And in fact, three years after establishment, and again seven years after establishment, the forage production inside the civil pasture stand did not differ any uh, statistically from an open pasture setting. We we're still getting the same amount of forage. Now the forage here was bahia grass. Okay? It is not the standard pasture grass that we see in East Texas, which is Bermuda grass. Bermuda grass does not do well in the partial shade environment that we see in a, in a civil pasture setting. A lot of the grass species, and this includes natives, that we probably kicked out of our toolbox for forage production in a pasture situation, uh, probably got ignore, are no longer commonly used because we tend to do it open pasture, no trees, put the cows out there, grow the forage, and we assume for some reason that the livestock are dealing with that very well. Except most of you have probably gone by any pasture with one or two trees in it, two in the afternoon in August, and where is the cattle? They're underneath the shade of that tree. 
This combines the, the, the capability of growing forage production, providing shade, which reduces the stress on the animal, which also increases the chance that they will be more comfortable, eat more, because they're less under stress, gain weight, which is more money for you. One of the differences between the spacing we see here and in a plantation setting is that we take multiple wood products off a of plantation. We start with pulp, and then we go to chip and saw type stage, saw timber, and in some places you can even go to, if you, depending on the species, uh, uh, poles. The purpose here economically in a civil pasture is, if properly done, you avoid that low end pulp product uh, as, as part of your regular thing. It becomes a bonus if you take anything out. You also get uh, some diversity in your income. It takes a number of years before you get a wood product off your uh, property in a plantation or even in a situation like civil pasture. But you're making money from hay or livestock every year in a civil pasture setting. And so that is also an important consideration is that economic uh, diversity when it comes into place. We we're very generous to get this uh, offer to us as, as a, a demonstration area. The landowner's deal was when we set this up is they'll get any revenue from any trees that they grow here uh, by giving us a chance to do this. And we've, we established them at our cost. We fertilized for the first two years at, at our cost. And then we try to contract with some uh, thinning operations, uh, but we can't get any takers on it because it's a relatively small area. One of the things that happens is that if you don't keep up with the, uh, the management of an area like this, you can lose control over it. We didn't fertilize because we didn't have any money for about eight, ten years. Uh, there was storm damage in here. Our quality, genetic quality of the seedlings was not as good as we had hoped. And so we've got some pretty bad quality stems in here. So anything you see here that's marked with blue um, is, is supposed to be taken out. And hopefully it will within the next year. Just about any uh, tree crop could be planted in a situation like this. Uh, Loblolly pine is commonly used in areas in East Texas because that's our common uh, tree species. You get into Mississippi, then longleaf pine becomes a more common species, especially in the southern half. You get into Florida, slash pine is used quite often. Uh, I'm not familiar with any shortleaf uh, silver pasture situations, but it would probably fit in farther to the north, just like we see with Loblolly here. Couple things about the branching pattern and everything we'll look at here, and then we'll go to a, uh, some trees where we have uh, longleaf. Is that choices of tree species may differ uh, and be selected because of the way they branch. These trees between rows are still not, they're just about reaching competition because the canopies are closing. Uh, longleaf pine, as we'll see in a bit, have that candelabra stage branching style where they curve up. That means there's less shade getting on uh, here for a few more years, which means your pro production of forage is going to be uh, better for a few more years. The other thing you have to keep in mind is the orientation of these rows. It's a little bit different than what we see in a plantation where you just kind of lay it out wherever you feel is the best way to operationally. Here, you want to make sure that you are running the rows north and south because the east-west pattern of the sun will get more sunlight into the, between the rows to, to support the uh, forage production. Fertilizer rates in these kind of systems are going to be at the forage rate, not the tree rate. And so basically that means the trees are getting a luxury of nutrients. They're getting fertilizer at a better rate than you would see uh, if they're just a plantation. Income on these things is, is uh, cumulative. It is not truly additive. If you took just the forage production and added to the, and then just got your timber production, it wouldn't be the same as uh, take the product from the plantation and an open pasture, get your income, uh, work out the uh, internal rate of return, add them together and say that's what you're going to get. No, you can't manage two crops and at the same property and maximize both of them. You lose some of both, but your cumulative 
is greater than either just the pasture or but just the plantation. Okay, we are standing in one of the blocks that was originally planted with longleaf pine. Now, grass stage meant that it was they were going to come out of that seedling stage a little bit later. We had a major issue when we established these things, and that was we were concerned about hog impacts on the longleaf pine. Uh, anecdotal stories about longleaf pine is that the hogs would go through and basically eat, pull out the seedlings of the ground because the high carbohydrate nature of those deeper and thick, uh, bigger diameter roots. We did not see that. We saw basically uh, that they buried the seedlings. When we site prep this whole area, whether it's plantation or here, we applied a herbicide before we planted and, and ripped. And so we ended up getting a lot of dead vegetation, but then the also result was that we got a lot of probably grubs and things in the ground consuming that dead material. And as a result, they just went straight down the rows and basically flipped over sod, flipping the, uh, on top of the seedlings. And so we lost a lot of them that way. We also, if you look around on this thing, uh, we have some volunteer loblolly pines that decided just to fall within the row, and we left them there because we lost a number of seedlings here. If you look behind me on the ground, the spacing between these rows is the same as it was in the first site with loblolly. Two things are showing up with more sun on the ground. Number one, we lost some trees within the row, so there's more sun coming through on the east to west nature of the sun movement. The other thing is the branching patterns of the longleaf with its curling branches, that candelabra type style, uh, definitely result in, in a, a narrower canopy and a wider space uh, between areas that are being the canopy competition. It's going to take longer for these to close. Dr. Stovall did some, some of his PhD work, was looking at a narrow, a variety of loblolly pine that looked at narrow uh, canopies. Uh, and so that would be something that might be interesting to explore in a situation like this. Think about the uh, Sonderriggers, okay? So you may have the more rapid rate of a loblolly pine expressing itself in a Sonderrigger pine with that curving branching pattern that we see in longleaf, and maybe that be an alternative species on there. There's a lot of unknowns that we have on the possibilities of this. When you think about silviculture as being the art and science of managing trees and forests for uh, production, silvopasture is heavy on the art and less on the known science because there's so much, so many options we can have on that landowner preference on a bunch of different things can come into play. Okay, we are in one of the blocks that the spacing was a, more of a traditional uh, plantation style of loblolly pine. Now we lost a number of these. It should have been thinned a couple years earlier. But um, obviously there's nothing on the ground of any forage value. There's a little clump here and there, but you're, you're very little. The shading was too much. The competition for light uh, the canopy's closed, the sunlight was not able to get down here. So from a silvopasture standpoint, this has no real value. Uh, from an animal standpoint, it's quite possible this has some value from the standpoint of the shade that's provided uh, to the animals at the hot part of the day. During the summer months, we'll often see the animals loaf, the cattle that the owner has, loafing here. Um, and then wandering off and eating in, in the open pasture or a silver pasture site. As I said, we did not uh, keep up with this. This should have been thinned uh, once, maybe twice. You can see some of the bad form that we have here. We ha we got hammered a couple times with ice ice storms. That was that was here, and that caused uh, some issues with the quality of the trees that were uh, that did survive. Today's a little unusual because it's a little breezy anyway. But there is a difference between air movement in a plantation versus one that you will see in a plantation setting, I mean a silvopasture setting. Uh, because of the wider spacing between the rows, there is a little more uh, air movement going on in a normal wind pattern, not the more breezy nature we have on this one. Which means that it's usually a little cooler there, less humid, here in East Texas than we would see in a plantation. 
as you may have seen in any of your other uh, activities with forestry on that one. I was asked about the plant, uh, animal choice, and that is an important consideration to look at is what impact will animals have on the, uh, the trees themselves. If a three-year-old pine plantation uh, or silver pasture is probably not going to be bothered, those trees are not going to be bothered by cattle. You put goats out there and they're going to be all over that stuff once they get their pre preference food taken care of. If you were talking about a hardwood versus a um, uh, conifer like a pine, then it's, that would change also because the uh, thinner bark of, of those hardwoods would make it more appealing to be nibbled on by, for example, goats. One of the things people often uh, ask me about silvopasture is can it be used commonly for hardwoods? There's uh, a lot of examples where it is, but not so much for the hardwoods for uh, wood production, but often for nut production. If you guys, you've all probably been to Pecan Park, you look at the layout of those trees, that's essentially a silvopasture setting. Those trees are in rows, they're spaced out, that was part of the old pecan orchard area. That was set up for specifically nut production with a livestock uh, component in there as well. Another product you can get off a of civil pasture is this stuff right here. Is that the monetary value of pine straw, especially longleaf pine straw, is an added another diverse economic income you might have. I visited one area in Mississippi, uh, no, excuse me, Louisiana, that they went ahead and had double, wide, double tr tree rows, wider spacing, uh, had a forage crop. Near the end of the growing season, just before all that needle fall occurred, they grazed it and then mowed it really short on the forage production, let the needles fall, and then basically raked up the pine straw and sold it in bulk, which was bundled up and then turned around and sold at Lowe's and Home Depot and places like that for uh, landscaping uh, material, mulch. And so that's another income that is often obtained. You could plant wildlife browse species between these trees, and that has been done. There has been some uh, practices in trying to attempt to see whether you could do some flower without having cattle out here, could you put uh, plants for cut flowers in between the rows. And so there's a lot of diversity that people look at in trying to double up or triple up income sources in these different settings.